Hey, look up on your screen, you'll see some facts about today. I uh, revise these each year, I usually try to, try to uh, put something up there, and uh, so I each year try to get these up to date. Average ticket price this year for the Super Bowl of today is $6,500. Uh, wow, huh? I think the last one I had up there was about $4,500, so it's going up. So, so just be glad you're here and didn't have to stress over that. Uh, the 30-second ad cost. Last time I had that up there was four and a half million. It's now going to five to five and a half million for 30 seconds. When the Super Bowl began, anybody got to remember how much a 30-second ad was? It's $40,000. So it's gone up just a little bit. That seems like a whole bunch of money. Now, I like the next one. I think the next one, I, that's just a new one I've picked up on this year. 1.25 billion poor chickens sacrificed their wings. So I ha cut that in half, and that's how many chickens sacrificed for the Super Bowl this afternoon. That's a whole lot, right? A lot of chickens. Um, <laughs> potato chips, yeah, there's one or two eating. 11.2 uh, million pounds of potato chips. And then, all for 25% of them watch the game. They just turned it on to watch the Super Bowl ads. And so that's just part of the game and the trivia of what goes on during the Super Bowl. And we, this morning, some of us reflect our affinities towards certain teams or you know, our love towards this or that. And some people say, well, I'm not a sports fan. You talk maybe too much about sports. But you're really a fan probably of something else, even if it's not a sports team, right? If you're not a, any of you like chocolate? <laughs> You're a fan of chocolate? Men, anybody like me, you're a fan of pie? You know, we have our affinities, those things that, that we do like anyway. So we, we, uh, we have our own interests sometimes, whether it's the Patriots, yuck, this afternoon, or, or the Eagles, whatever. You know, Patriots were thrown in the cold side for too many years, so we can't get too excited about them. But it, it's a big game, it's a big event. That's what I bring forward, and we are oftentimes called fans of those. But there's a, a few years ago, this book was put out by Kyle Eidelman called Not a Fan. Not a Fan. To be confused with our belief, our following Jesus, with not just being a fan of Jesus, but being a follower of Jesus. A fan is described as an enthusiastic admirer. And you go to a lot of, fan, a lot of games, and I know a whole lot more Fans were, they go over the top sometimes with that enthusiastic, in fact, they, they admire the officials a little too much sometimes because they always want to talk to them. So you get a lot of enthusiastic admirers out there, but fans sometimes, fans uh, about, about our relationship with God. It says in this book, it says fans, fans want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits but not so close to require sacrifice. Love the benefits. You know, as I mentioned last week, sometimes we treat God as an ATM. We punch in a prayer and open our arms to receive it. But are we willing to go along for the sacrifice? And remember, if we're going to model ourselves after the life of Christ, from the very beginning, He was in it for the sacrifice for, for you and I. Fans may be fine with repeating a prayer, attending church, semi-regular basis, um, you know, putting a fish on the bumper. Some of those things might do those things. But where are we willing to be all in? Are we willing, willing to really be a follower? So I ask you the question this morning, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a true follower of Jesus? So as we begin and we look at and we unpack this very short passage this morning about Jesus calling some faithful disciples to come with him, just ask yourself, am I a fan or a follower as we enter into this time? So here's the scripture and let's pray before we begin. Lord, open our hearts to receive these words that you have given to us about a calling, about just an invitation. And Lord, that we might be open to receiving the invitation and then following you with all our heart, mind, and soul. Amen. So we go to Mark. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to share more out of the Gospel of Mark this year. And you'll once again see much, much more concise with the words. As Jesus walked, and I love that part of Jesus. I think 
that, that's one of the best parts of Jesus is that attracts me to him that he walked. In the previous ministries, I, I, I enjoyed where our church was at because we were right in the middle of town. Out here, we're kind of more in the burbs out here in this, this end of town in McCutcheonville. It's more, you know, there's not really, it's spread out. Now, in the, the scenic downtown Patoka, <laughs> our beautiful Amish country up in Lagodi, right, Joe? The, we were, the church was right in the middle of town. And if I went any place, I walked. And I tell you, I did a lot of ministry while walking in those towns. And uh, it just, if you were, avail you were available, you were there. So Jesus, I, you know, he... He didn't have the keys to the car anyway, so he walked every place he went. So, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, and I have to think he enjoyed those walks beside the Sea of Galilee because it's such a beautiful place. He saw Simon, this is Simon Peter, later be known just as Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake. So that's their job. That's their profession. They were, he saw them fishing. For they were fishermen. And he simply said these three words, Come! Follow me. And they said, well, let me think about it. Let's go talk to somebody. Let me see if my 401k is all right. Let me see if I can, you know, if I can put in the time. No. He said, just, Jesus simply said, and I will make you fish for people. And at once, at once, they left their nets and followed him. Impulsive? I don't happen to think so. They saw something. They saw what they needed to see in this man to make they want to, follow, want to follow him. Moves on rather quickly. Two more verses. A lot happened in these four verses. And when he had gone a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, who would also be the son of Zebedee, John, in a boat, preparing their nets. So they were fishermen as well. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired man and followed him. Now dad's probably saying, wait a minute. You're supposed to take over the business someday. We've got fish to deliver. We've got orders. We have all this to do. But they left. Did they get a better offer? Did they get a better job opportunity? Did they interview for this position and, and think, ah, can't turn it down? No. They followed the person of Jesus. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know what he was up to. They didn't know what he was going to be doing, what his ministry is about. Yet they went. They went. Moves forward. There's some verses in between all this. I want to give you the whole picture now in chapter 3. Afterward, and afterwards is always big, a big word. I, I want to stop for a moment. I'm not sure I've ever explained afterwards in my problem. You know, when I get to therefore, sometimes I want to explain why it's therefore. But an afterward would always struggle. I'd wonder about that. If a preacher would come with the afterward, you know, I'd lose the rest of the message to go back and try to figure out after what? You know, after breakfast, after whatever. But the afterward in this case was Jesus had been out healing, casting out demons, if you want to go back and look at this. So he had made an impression on people. And people were thronging to him to the point where he had to kind of pull himself away from them. So that was the afterward in this case. Afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain and called out the ones he wanted to go with him. And they came to him. Once again, very responsive to him. Then he appointed 12 of them and called them his apostles. They were to accompany him, and he would send them out to preach, giving them authority to cast out demons. Okay. And here they are. Here's the 12. He chose Simon, who would later become Peter, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. <laughs> I, I, you know, Jesus had a sense of humor, I think. A, a big sense of humor. And here it is. This, is. this is part of his... We like nicknames. You know, he'd say, all right, sons of thunder, come on, let's go. I, I, you know, did they pack a big stick? Were they very boisterous? Were they, they probably were. You know, they were impressionable. Sons of thunder is an impression of, of this. So they... they, they uh, uh, either that or Zebedee was a, a thunderous guy, right? <laughs> he could have been dad was the issue. But maybe dad was, uh, gave it to Jesus for taking these boys. I don't know. But nicknamed them the sons of thunder. And then uh, Andrew, who was Peter's brother. Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. Now you want that put on the back of your name, Simon the Zealot. 
And Judas Iscariot, and you definitely don't want this on the back of the name, who later would betray him. Those are the 12. Qualified? No. Nah. No. Educated? No way. Prepared? Absolutely not. Just came from the, the simplest of occupations, of, the, the, you know, the, of backgrounds, of society and whatever, and went to follow him. They probably were known for one thing. And I, I, I would think this, and I've, I've done funerals where I've, the family has said this about the person or a friend has said this about the person. Usually it's when there's some testimonies about them. They would always say, well, you could always count on this person. You know, they were always known for their hard work or for, for being honest, or you could count, you could, you know, if they told you something, they would deliver. And I think that's probably what we have here. They were hard workers, they were, they were known for that, no, not known maybe for anything more special than that. They would later be known for something more special than that, but at this point in time when they were called, no, I don't think so. They were just simple, ordinary men who were called to do that. And, I, and going back to verse 14, he ordained 12 that they should be with him, very, very short purpose, and that they should go out and preach. And then cast out demons and healing was part of that as well. But they should go out as apostles. What were they supposed to bring to the public? Good news. Good news. Good news. And this area needed some good news. This particular time was full of bad news and bad and corruption and, and strife and such throughout the land. But he appointed them to go out and tell the good news about God, about Jesus, about what was now that the kingdom of God was at hand. So following Jesus. Following Jesus. Remember Jesus got his start by... I relayed that last week. He was baptized. Jesus said, that, or the God, the Heavenly Father said, this is my son and who I'm well pleased. He was then challenged or had his temptation and trials in the desert. And then he began his ministry. So these are, this, think about these now, these 12. It's kind of going to be a similar start for them. They have to go through some pain and some struggles along this way. And that's after being chosen to do this. He, and I almost get the impression too, uh, when, I, when I read this, that they were, more or less, when they were selected, it's like they were drafted in the position. Anybody drafted in the military? <laughs> Did you enjoy that? No. no, you didn't want to be drafted. I, fortunately, back in 1971, my draft number was 265. And so that was high enough that I didn't get asked to go take a physical for Vietnam. And um, others did. Many were drafted into the service. Some signed up on their own. Some were drafted. When you got that letter, it says, Dear friend, I think, or, or dear... Friend and fellow American. Yeah, dear friend and fellow American. You remember that, don't you? <laughs> you don't forget that. <laughs> friend and neighbors, that's what, yeah. So, you know, that was, it was a friendly greeting, but you were invited to be part of something big whether you wanted to go do that or not. But there you did. Now, in this case, I, yes, these 12 had a choice. They would not have had to follow. But it's like when they were selected, they didn't want to say no either. And I can relate to that a bit. Whenever I was called to ministry back in the late 90s, it wasn't like I didn't get dear friends and neighbors or dear, dear past, future Pastor Greg or, or anything like that. It was like, it was just the, the message was, it was, it was something placed in my heart that I couldn't say no to. And so I can kind of relate to what they were about here as well. But if I was in this case, when I didn't know what this was about, you know, I had a good idea. I'd been in the church all my life, what a pastor was going to do. These guys didn't know what they were getting into. They didn't know what, what following Jesus, going down that road would be like. And it was, it was going to be troublesome. They, they were going to have a lot of heartache. They weren't going to eat well. They weren't going to sleep well. They, weren't, they were going to be, you know, they were, a lot of people were going to talk about it. Those Pharisees were going to talk about it. It wasn't going to be easy. There wasn't a, a description of what an apostle was going to be. So I think about myself. If I'm following Jesus in the way that they were, would I be able to stay awake? Would I be able to stay alert? Would I be able to be open to all those discussions and, and that, were, that Jesus was teaching and such? Or would I be like Peter? and be impulsive and 
and be told, get behind me, Satan, and those kind of things. I, I don't know. So just imagine for a moment. So I'm going to take us to bring us to communion time this morning. Just imagine for a moment. What if your name was on that list? How would you respond? How would you respond to Jesus coming up to you and saying, come with me? Come. Just come and follow me. How would you respond? I'm going to tell you something. It's now. He's asked you now. As a Christian, as a Christian, we are that person. We are those twelve. We are those who have who has been called to go forth. So I prayed in my prayer this morning. We're his children. All his children as the church and as his people are called. Your name is on the list. Your name could be written on the end of that list. Could I walk in his steps? Could I walk in the steps of Jesus? Remember, it's a fairly narrow road. It's a narrow road. There's only one God, one true God. He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life. No one comes to the Father except through Jesus. We follow Him. We follow His ways. People are going to point. Christianity's. It's not, it's not the 50s anymore. People don't look at, at Christ followers, especially those who want to follow Him truly with all their heart, mind, and soul in a very positive light anymore. Can I walk in His steps? Well, you do now. If you call yourself a Christian, you do now. You do now. So what do I say? You say, I'm on that list. I, I'm one who follows Him. What do I say? I'm going to give you the words. I'm going to make it easy for you. It's real easy what you have to say, what you get to say when you go out. Found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. Again, very few verses. You, mark, you ought to mark these in your Bible. Here they are. I know it's small print. That's why you should have your Bibles. But here we go. Let me now remind you. I like the way Paul prefaces this. Let me now remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You know, I, you've been in church before, right? About everybody here, probably this isn't their first Sunday. As I say, it's not your first rodeo. So you might have heard this before. This is good news. It's good news that does even good things for you. It saves you. So if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place, Paul says, I passed on to you what was most important and what has been and passed on to me. Paul says, I boil it down to this. Christ died for our sins. Amen. Can't get you simpler than that, does it? Jesus, we're getting ready for Easter. We're getting ready for preparation time for Lent. It's about Christ dying for our sins. Just as the scripture said, don't, don't subtract that. He was buried. He was dead. He was buried. That was part of the communion liturgy that we often repeat. And then, the celebration of Easter happened. He was raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said. What's that give us? Surely goodness and mercy followed me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'll celebrate. I have eternal life. I have the joy of that. That's good news. Pretty simple, isn't it? All we have to tell people, that's why he says, go out and preach this. Why? It's good news. That's why we should... Have a heart to do that. This morning I'm going to invite you to Holy Communion. This is a good Sunday. It's a, the first Sunday of the month. We celebrate Holy Communion. We celebrate it by coming up. And, and all are invited, by the way, to the table. It's a table of grace, which grace is poured out to all of us. You break off a piece of bread, take a cup. You can spend time in prayer if you want to. We put the cups in the basket. Go back to your seat if that's what you like. But it's, it's, that's the way we do it. The why we do it is to come and meet Jesus. To ask for Him to be present with us, which He is. To ask for forgiveness, and we all need forgiveness. To ask for His grace to, to, to come into our hearts and lives, to, to receive us, to, to use us, to send us, to follow Him. Whereas Christ has died. Christ is buried. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Let's pray. Lord, we're about to receive what you offered to those disciples on that night. Those twelve that you had trained and, and taught and, and uh, walked with. 
spent so much time, poured into them, and then on that last night you offered them the cup and the bread, representing, representing your body, your blood, poured out of you into us for the remission of sins, for a life that is eternal, and for hope for tomorrow. Lord, we pray to you now. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me, O Lord, for I have sinned. Receive me, O Lord. And use me, O Lord. Amen. Those who are going to serve now, come forward and we'll invite all to come.